tonight. He is an icon of the 60s, father of the flower children. From coast to coast, Jerry Garcia was known as the psychedelic king of Haight-Ashbury. Perhaps more than any other musician, he epitomized the turn-on, tune-in, drop-out generation. His band, The Grateful Dead, and their hypnotic jam sessions spawned a legion of loyal, if not obsessive, fans known as Deadheads. They were there at Woodstock and Monterey Pop, anti-establishment heroes in an era of rebellion, cosmic consciousness, and drugs. New Year's Eve, 1990. Over 25 years since their beginnings, the Grateful Dead are in concert live with adoring fans fueled once again by their music. Today, there is a whole new younger generation of Garcia lovers joining the near cult of long-haired, tie-dyed, devoted. They dance and cavort with fans three and four times their age. They follow the group from concert to concert, even to the Great Pyramid in Egypt. They often act more like disciples in a pagan ritual than rock fans. They're mesmerized by one of the most phenomenal bands in the history of pop music. Garcia's father was a well-known swing band leader in San Francisco in the 20s and 30s. Ironically, in the 60s and 70s, Jerry would play some of the same clubs that heard Jose Garcia's music. Jerry was just a boy when his father died in 1947, but the associations and the music are in his blood. So you never saw him perform? I never perform? saw him perform, no, I never did, except around the house with his clarinet and stuff, so I never saw him, I never saw him perform, but I, I grew up with publicity pictures of him in his bands and his orchestras and his tuxedo and, you know, look, looking good. And I've looked at some of the music that, the arrangements, there are a few around that, trying to imagine, you know, what's, what was this guy's music like, you know? How much did his life or the fact that he was a musician influence you? It's, uh, it's hard to tell about the genetic thing, you know, whether there's a, like a music gene or something like that, but certainly the ambience, the thing of, all, of growing up in a house where there was always a few instruments. Mm -hmm. For me, the thing, the music um, always had a, some kind of power over me. I, I can remember my, some of my earliest experiences are just the thing of listening to records over and over and over and over again, driving everybody crazy until they, they finally would take the records away and break them or hide <laughs> them or something. Do you remember your first band? Oh, yeah. I, I, the first band I played with was when I was in high school, up at Annaly High School in, in uh, Sebastopol. That was the first, first time I got paid for playing music. I got $5, I think. From that humble start, Jerry and the Grateful Dead went on to international fame, selling millions of records. And it all started in 1966 in the land of flower power, the Haight-Ashbury. Along with Ken Kesey and his merry pranksters, Jerry Garcia became a hero to the counterculture. Nicknamed Captain Trip, he was immortalized by author Tom Wolfe in the electric Kool-Aid acid test. Like a Pied Piper leading the way, he was high priest of the hate, and the Grateful Dead's lyrics celebrated the use of drugs. Six years ago, Jerry Garcia put drugs behind him. These days, he gets his highs from working compulsively and trying to save the planet. He and the Grateful Dead play dozens of benefit concerts, turning over millions of dollars to causes, ranging from AIDS to hunger and the rainforest. Now, at age 48, the graying guitarist is hoping to leave a better world for his children. You've really developed a strong sense of responsibility, haven't you? That that we've got not, some, not really. Well, yeah, no, but it's different really. than yeah. than the past, than the '60s and '70s. I, no, not no. It's not really different. It's not really different. The the, the the difference is that as you get older and you start to your kids are growing up and stuff like that, you start to see there's a continuity there that. Uh, that you want for the best stuff to be around for the for the people that you uh, that you love. When you go on stage, what does it feel like for you? And I'm scared that to death every time. Oh come on! No, I am. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, I sure am. Yeah. Why? Hey, what do you think it's like going down there well, in front of 18,000 people, you know? I don't know. I, I thought you'd be in heaven, I mean, just on another plane. Oh, no, it's frightening. It's horribly frightening until the very first, until, until actually the music starts. When the music starts, then it's like, oh, right, right. Now, don't you feel a sense of power on stage? 
no, God, no, it's, it isn't like that. You know, no. it's, no, you must be feeling a sense of helplessness, vast helplessness. Okay, what about, <laughs> what about your high highs on stage? Uh, what then I that? feel like it's just a great place to be. You know, it's like there's no place I'd rather be. And is that rare to have that feeling? It's not so rare that, uh, it's rare enough that I miss it when it's not there, mm -hmm. you know, and it's also rare enough that uh, you keep hoping that it'll happen. Some would say that it's you and the Grateful Dead who, who really institutionalized jamming. I mean, being able to play the same song for 25 years and never the same way. How important is the jam to the success of the Grateful Dead? I think it's very important. I mean, it may be the most important single factor in uh, what we do. And it is this improvisational, unpredictable playing the fans love. They record the concerts as they happen, making pirate copies they trade with each other. The Grateful Dead actually encourages this bootlegging. How does the record industry react to these bootleg copies? It, it, it scares them, but I don't think there's any reason why. We have, we, I, don't, I think that it's clear that there's no real competition between uh, live tapes and, and records. So just, just, they're two different worlds, you know? I gotta cover some, what to you is gonna be old territory, but your followers will never forgive me if I don't bring it up. And that is the phenomenon of the Grateful Dead. Heard it before. Uh. Yeah, on and on and on. But you've taken this traveling circus through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, now the 90s. Yeah. You're playing to the kids of hippies. Yeah. What's why the question? Why, why your band and, and no other band? You're the only uh, one doing this. Well, I've, I've been asking myself that question ever since the first, uh, the first time there were more people in the audience than there were on stage. Yeah. You know, it's, I, 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 I don't know why. I, uh, I don't know. I, I, we're, we're, just, we're, we're just doing what we do. And as time goes on, we get so we can do it better and better, you know. I, it's got to amaze you, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, well, this has already gone way past my expectations. You know, yeah, you can imagine. I mean, first of all, you don't expect for a band to last even 10 years, much mm -hmm. less 25 plus. So, uh, you know, at this point, we're so far beyond my own expectations that I, I don't have, we're totally in uncharted territory as far as I'm concerned. I don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, you've been known to say that uh, you're running out of places to play. Yeah. True? Well, it's, uh, I wouldn't say we're running out of place. I think that's a little alarmist, but there are you places... You said it, but a little bit of an overstatement. Yeah, it's a bit of an overstatement, yeah. But uh, it's true that there are places where we can't go back. Yeah, that's true. And it's because you get thousands and thousands of fans who come without tickets. Yeah. And they camp days, if not weeks, ahead of time. That's right. And uh, they share sometimes, their food and, and... They sometimes disrupt the frail ecology of the places that we're playing. So you've, you've uh, sent out a message to these deadheads. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, we, we try to communicate with them regularly if we can. But what do you tell them? Uh, well, we tell them, here's the situation, you guys. If you want us to keep playing, uh, you're going to have to cool out. They want the Grateful Dead to continue to exist, and they want us to play. And we want to do that, too. Your lyrics have changed over the years, kind of with the times. Yeah, a little bit. Um, and what is it? A touch of gray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In doing touch of gray, it seems that you're you're saying to everybody, "Hey, we are middle aged. It's okay." We're not middle aged. We're old. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think of yourself as mature? No, not really, no. I'm sorry. I, I wish I wish I did. I wish I could. I just don't, you know. You are a father of four girls. Though, yeah, that's and, right. and I know you don't like to talk about your family, but not a lot of people much. would would like to know what kind of a father you are. I think I'm really a poor father. Oh, come on. Poor affair, maybe, possibly. You'd have to ask them, really, you yeah. know, to know for sure. But they like are, me. They like me. Your girls are age 3 to 26? That's right, 26, 27, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What do you worry about for them, or do you? Oh, the world, the whole world. You know, I worry that they'll, I worry, worry that they'll hurt themselves on any level. I worry that, uh, uh, I worry that their lives won't have enough happiness in them. 
Um, you know, things like that. Fatherly worries. Are you, know. you strict? No. I'm a pushover. Do you advise them about drugs? I try not to advise them about very much unless they seek my advice. I, I don't think that I know enough about stuff to conf confidently advise them. I think that they're smart. Uh, luckily, they are smart. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they frequently advise me. This may be on the uh, kind of a, a sorrowful note because you don't like to look back. But how do you hope your legacy reads? <clears throat> Uh, well, uh, let me see. Well, you're already in who's who and all that stuff. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 uh, I haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, ideally, I would like to disappear gracefully and not, not leave behind any legacy to hang people up. You know what I mean? I, I don't want people agonizing over what, who or what I was when I was here when I'm not here anymore. You know, <laughs> I'd rather they did that now while I'm here. <laughs> But would it be as a great musician? Oh, God, I, I don't think of myself as great. I would like to be thought of as a competent musician. That would be good. Uh -huh. I'd like that. Headliners will return with Alice Walker.